4 and 4. Overview. The Eternals of the Six Realms engage in politics and diplomacy with the Empire just as the foreign nations do. While the Archmage of each realm generally overlooks formal contact between the Empire and the Eternals, those who've not been marked as enemies can still send their heralds to bring messages on their behalf, just as the barbarians beyond the borders can impact the lives of those who should be safe within them, even those who have enmity of the conclave, who are designated enemies of the Empire, can sometimes influence Imperial citizens. These Eternals love to meddle in Imperial affairs, sometimes via the Imperial Conclave, sometimes directly with Imperial citizens. Sometimes they offer opportunities, agreements that benefit the Empire just as much as the Eternal. Sometimes they present problems, and working out a way to overcome the challenges they create can tax even the most cunning mind. And while most interactions involve diplomacy and negotiation, some spill over into violence and need a group of Imperial heroes to ensure a bad situation does not get worse. Embers in the Dragonforge, Barion. At the summer solstice, the Heralds of Barion will be holding court at House Geris in Wintermark between 7pm and 9pm on Friday evening. They have challenge scrolls for Alethea, Daughter of Carmen, and Lightning on the Ice. A number of challengers have been invited to a rewarding ceremony. Edric of House de Frost, Edric Fjellravening, Tono Shatha Rakeza, Percival Tolstag, Silas Falconer, Solomon Locke, Melek Greatheart and Viridan Silver. The heralds wish to speak with Skjall Bjornsson and Blythe Sinan. Barion owes the artisans of Wintermark a schema. They will need to decide amongst themselves what they wish to ask of the Iron Duke. As the seasons turn and the days lengthen to their peaks, flurries of letters find their ways into the hands of Imperial citizens who've sought the favour and challenge of Barion, the Iron Duke. The favoured agents of the Lord of the Crossroads in the Empire, the Heralds, Revel, Bellows, Temper and Flute, have been busy recently, as more and more folks seek to find meaning and test themselves against whatever Barion has to offer. Not that the Iron Duke is complaining. He's always happy to see the Imperials testing themselves against ever greater ambitions, and has seen the monumental tasks the Empire has recently completed. Though scholars of the Summer Realm will note a word of caution, that while Barion has the amity and friendship of the Empire... He deals with all nations who wish to deal with him equally, and is known to have close ties with the Empire's enemies also. This summer, the Iron Duke invites Alethea, daughter of Carmen and Lightning on the Ice, to come retrieve their scroll of challenge and begin their tasks, while the pair of Skull Bjornsson and Blythe Sinan should come discuss their request with Barian servants, so the Lord of Crossroads can find them a suitable quest. At the upcoming gathering, the Iron Duke's servants will be hosted in Wintermark by House Geris between 7 and 9pm on Friday, at the arrangement of Scarrow of the Mark, who's been cheerfully described by Ravel as admirably persistent. The Heralds will be looking for a host in the autumn also, so any interested parties should find the Heralds to make inquiries. One final matter that the Lord of the Crossroads looks to settle is the topic of the schema that he's promised to the assembled artisans of Wintermark to be added to their collection of runesmiths' lore. Barion has decided it would be most appropriate for the artisans to collectively decide amongst themselves what sort of item plan they'd like Barion to provide, and whether the schema should be for something extravagant and expensive or more affordable and widely used. Whatever the decision, the artisans of the Mark will need to communicate this to the heralds once made so that their lord can make the arrangements for the schema to be delivered. As always, the dutiful heralds remind their imperial hosts that they will return on Sunday afternoon at around 1pm if there is any further business to conduct, or if anyone wasn't able to meet them on the Friday. Flickers of Flame Janon Janon's interest in the Empire flares and dims like a dancing flame. Following the decisive strikes against Chaloncio and the Rackensgrab, his attention to Imperial affairs seems to be very much on the rise. His heralds are regularly visiting Anvil, encouraging people to embrace their passions and continue to take action to reshape their world. The Shadowed Flame is also a great fan of the Burning Falcon, the Brass Coast army that rose from the ashes of the past and immediately went to war with the Yotun. 
Indeed, at the invitation of General Aracelis Iorigo, heralds of the Night Eternal are spotted fighting alongside the army in the recent battles to retake Karaman. The warlike heralds are especially fond of the Kohan, inspiring those who fight alongside them to fight even more enthusiastically, fanning the flames of passion that burns within them. They don't just restrain their support to the Kohan, however. The soldiers of the Burning Falcon, who take the time to get to know the heralds, are urged to identify what it is that drives them to fight and to embrace it, allowing it to consume them and give them the strength they'll need to seize the world by the throat and make it beg for mercy. By all accounts, it can be an intense experience. Whistle and I'll come. Any general can invite Janon to send his warrior heralds to fight alongside their army. So far, only General Aracelis has invited the heralds of Janon to fight alongside their army. Those heralds have told anyone that will listen that the warrior spirits of the Shadowed Flame seek the opportunity to get to know the Empire a little better by fighting alongside armies from every nation. Any general who includes in their orders that they invite Janon's warriors to join them for a season will find a cadre of heralds accompanying their soldiers after the summer solstice until the start of the autumn equinox. The score or so of midnight blue warriors that fought with the burning flame were noticeable but didn't have much of an impact on the actual outcome of the battle. They're enthusiastic fighters, burning alternately with fury at the Otoon and love for the freeborn soldiers they fight beside, but nothing to the scale of a thousand knights of glory. Still, the offer's there if they wish to take advantage of it. A freeborn magician of the unfettered mind, named Lector Italamoni Riqueza, who fought alongside the Burning Falcon, points out that while Janon's heralds are far too undisciplined to work well fighting beside an army in any great numbers, assuming the Eternal could even field that many warriors, there's an interesting alternative. If the Eternal could be convinced to allow it, a ritual similar to the clarion call of ivory and dust might be created – that would let Janon send his warriors to fight effectively alongside a smaller military force. Of course, in addition to the challenge of getting Janon to agree to such a thing, there might be an additional challenge in that the Eternal is notoriously volatile, even more so than Eleonaris, and through Imperial history has regularly been the subject of the Conclave's enmity. But the innate dissonances of night magic means it offers precious few ways for its magicians to support Imperial armies. And there are any number of Imperial captains who would appreciate a cadre of volatile, violent, furious, passionate fighters battling alongside their troops. One for the Archmage of Night to consider, perhaps. An unquenchable flame. Janon's heralds have been agitating for the Burning Falcon to let their passions blaze like the sun. When the Burning Falcon were being reborn, there was some discussion of surpassing the original army in passionate commitment to the ideals of the Brass Coast. The heralds of Janon, having had wind of this from the soldiers that they fought beside, have brought it to the Eternal's attention. Again, he thinks it's an excellent idea and is genuinely puzzled why the freeborn priests didn't embrace it with both hands when it was first suggested. Obviously, the opportunity to pass the mandate has long since passed and the priests have made their decision. But... Part of embracing your passions is never letting the past dictate your destiny, and night magic echoes with the resonance of transformation. So, perhaps the opportunity isn't lost after all. The Eternal has a very real interest in the Imperial Synod, and makes no secret of the fact he loves to see people burn with virtuous passion, especially courage, ambition, loyalty and pride. If the Freeborn National Assembly raises a well-worded statement of principle that passes with a greater majority, urging the Kohan of their nation to support the Burning Falcon and make it a beacon of unquenchable flame, they might be able to fill the newly-fledged army with true conviction, especially if their statement invites Janon to help do it. Alternatively, if General Aracelis has a passion burning in their heart, they could just cut out the middleman. The current destructive conjunction allows a small window of opportunity to spark a dramatic transformation in the army. Janon plans to gift the general with a token that will channel some of the shadowed flame's love of the freeborn people. If this token is used as a focus during a performance of transmogrification of the soul's echo, targeting the general of the army during which they focus on identifying and embracing their true passions, the magic will spread through the entire army. For the next season, the soldiers and any freeborn military unit that supports them will find it easier to embrace the passions that drive them. This will count as an enchantment on the army, however, 
replacing any other enchantment and in turn being replaced with a more warlike magic if it were embraced. However, if that performance also includes 25 rings of Ilium, the change will echo back and forth between their soldiers, their standards and the general. The effect will grow with each reverberation and by the start of the winter solstice, the army will have been so inspired its quality will permanently change to true conviction, assuming the enchantment is not removed prematurely. Janon's Herald is quick to point out that while the transformation will start with Janon, he seeks no dominion over the army. It will not place the soldiers or the general in his thrall, and it won't be lost if the Eternal is placed under enmity. He would, however, encourage his heralds to support the army and pay particular attention to its fortunes, in a similar vein to which the Spider King supports and watches over some of the Navarre armies. Here is the true conviction quality. Can only use the triumphant charge or forced march order when attacking. Can only use the final stand or desperate reinforcement order when defending. An army with true conviction is filled with passionate intensity and zeal. During battle, the soldiers fight to the absolute best of their ability, and while resting, they embrace everything life has to offer, knowing that they may die in their next battle. They are utterly committed to the act of war, able to traverse the empire like a blazing comet, smashing into the enemies of the freeborn people with an unquenchable fury. However, this quality means that the general is only able to issue the triumphant charge, final stand, forced march, and desperate reinforcement orders, they cannot use any of the standard orders normally available to a general. The only thing that will allow them to take a different order is a special opportunity or an enchantment that influences or temporarily changes their quality. Fire in the grass. Some of Janon's heralds will be visiting Anvil during the coming summit. They're probably arriving around seven in the evening on Saturday of the summit. Last summit, a group of heralds came to Anvil and... Things didn't go as well as the Eternal might have liked. There was some misunderstanding about when exactly they were arriving and so missed their chance to speak to some of those that they were keen to meet. So during the summer, another small group of Janon's heralds are planning to visit Anvil during the coming summit. They want to speak to the Shatterers of Chains, especially Ashbourne Pact, about their desire to burn out the cancer of slavery from this world forever. The Flame of Virtue intends to repeat their visit to Anvil at seven in the evening on Saturday. They will arrive via the Hall of Worlds and intend to adjourn from there to the camp of the Imperial Orcs. From there, they will give the Orcs their undivided attention. That last statement is slightly undercut by the Herald also asking whether Cahendrin Wordsmith of Dawn might meet them there, as they have some markers of Janon's favour for him. There are a few others of interest, Vanya Oddsbreaker and those Dornish, you know the ones, the ones who want to kill all the Druge. When asked if there's anyone else to add to that list, the Herald gives the same answer as they did last season. Anyone who cares enough will show up. Anyone who doesn't can be ignored. Obviously, the Heralds will have limited ability to negotiate on behalf of the Shadowed Flame, of course. But the Empire already knows how to do that. A shadow on the glass. Kimus. Observers from the realm of Kimus will be arriving in the Hall of Worlds, keen to attend the Anvil Summit at five o'clock on Saturday. Kimus has also challenged the Imperial Synod to present what they believe and what they know about what actually happens to humans and orcs after they die. Much like Janon, the interest of the eternal Kimus brightens and dims. At the moment, it seems the glass of the heavens has its attention focused on the Empire, and for the last several summits, many-eyed heralds have appeared at Anvil, observing events and making quiet inquiries about the matter that their mistress is currently most interested in. The way that mortals die. During the coming summit, some of her observers will be attending. They anticipate arriving in the Hall of Worlds at five in the evening on Saturday and would appreciate it if there is a magician present who can help them pass through and reach Anvil. As an eternal without amity, Gimus's heralds are subject to the ban of Tharim and so cannot even cross the Hall of Worlds without assistance. They are keen to discuss matters relating to the end of mortal life and what comes after, with special regard to the nature of the labyrinth and the use of Liao. There's also a talk of a possible experiment that Kimis believes could theoretically be undertaken to discover more actual facts about the labyrinth, should anyone be interested. 
While it mostly deals in facts, Kimis's messenger also mentions that their mistress is very interested in hearing what exactly the Imperial Synod believes happens after a human and an orc die. The doctrine of the labyrinth, reincarnation and howling abyss are clear enough statements of belief, but how does any of it work in a concrete, practical sense? Where are the labyrinth, the howling abyss and the place that is across the howling abyss? How does a dead person actually get there? How do they get back in the case of humans when they reincarnate? How does virtue actually help traverse the labyrinth? If any of the assemblies are interested in presenting statements about the matter, Kimis would be very interested to learn what they believe, and more importantly, what they think is true. Beacon in the Storm Lashinar. The eternal Lashinar has sent messengers to deliver replies to the letters they solicited last season. Last season, the gibbering one arranged a peculiar exchange of letters. In the last days before the summer solstice, the Herald Litany, list keeper for the speaker in dreams, again turns up to harass the civil servants at the hub. Although this time she's brought three more child-sized birds who look like a wood dove, a nightingale and a magpie, but significantly larger, who have heard good things about the seed cake found at the hub. With a lot of back and forth and bickering, the four heralds take eight times as long to deliver their message. But in the end, they manage to communicate the words of their master, Conscience of Kings. The Keeper of the Gates of Wisdom has been greatly heartened by the response of imperial citizens to their offer to facilitate an exchange of letters with spiritually minded philosophers around the known world. The number of people who took advantage of this has made his heart swell two sizes. It speaks well of the Empire that its people are so keen to speak to strangers about matters that weigh on their souls. In fact, the four heralds are charged to go and start delivering the replies as soon as the seed cake runs out. Out of character note, the chance to exchange letters via Lashinar has now ended. It was a single event opportunity. Finally, on a more serious and more cryptic note... The Guardian of the Southern Skies wants the Empire to know that it has delivered the message they were asked to deliver. After due consideration, they have sent the vision of the Hound and the Snake to the people of the Malum because they felt they were the beings most in need of hearing it. Most will dismiss it as nothing more than a wistful dream, but some will heed its message and draw hope for the future from it. Without explaining any further what this is about, the four heralds finish the last of the seed cake and depart. Presumably to deliver the many letters written by foreign philosophers. Strangers and Friends Conjunction Decius Frostbire is being pursued by a force of Druge. Lashinar has asked for aid in stopping the Druge hunting their herald. The Sentinel Gate will open at half past eight on Saturday to the Thicket of Thorns, Nessus Tack Forest, Sarengrave. The magician Eliza of Savos has been asked by Lashinar to find a way of stopping the Druge. On the subject of orcs from the Malum, a bizarre request has come from the Conscious of Kings that relates to the orcs of the Sarengrave. One of their heralds, Decius Frostspire, has been active in the Sarengrave for some time and was one of those responsible for delivering his vision of hounds and serpents. The last communication from Decius mentioned that a het sent him a message to request a meeting. And that meeting turned out to be a trap, perhaps predictably. Decius fled, pursued by the Druge, and also, for some reason, heralds of Surut. Lashinar has requested that a league magician thespian named Eliza of Salvos, they who called the little birds, help the fleeting herald reach safety. Decius has taken refuge in the Thicket of Thorns, somewhere in Nessustak Forest, and fortunately, a conjunction of the Sentinel Gate has been identified that will allow a group to get to the vicinity and hopefully offer succour to the Herald. If the Druge and the Heralds closing in on Decius are killed or forced to rout, then Lashinar will grant Eliza the choice of arranging a meeting with anyone she wishes to speak to via the Caucus Forum at the Autumn Equinox 385. While they could pick anyone at all, Lashinar is keen to arrange a meeting between the Empire and a representative from one of the Bloodwater Spears, the Waterwalkers or the Grinbor. Lashinar is quick to reassure Eliza that whoever they choose, the Eternal will do their best to arrange a meeting regardless. Assuming Decius is saved, they'll be able to provide a suitable piece of parchment that, when used in conjunction with Operate Portal at the Imperial Regio, will allow Eliza to let Lashanar know who she wishes to meet with. 
The Druge force is apparently made up of warriors from across the Arkad, along with a number of heralds of the Ashen Knight. Given Lashinar has specifically requested Eliza of Sarvos deal with the matter, the civil service agree that they have responsibility to oversee the use of the conjunction. They may wish to seek out the assistance of whoever is appointed as Imperial Consul, given the obvious diplomatic implications of the situation, or perhaps seek the advice of the Archmage of Night in gathering a suitable force of warriors. A quick note on the conjunction. This encounter takes place in Sarengrave and is affected by Druge Miasma. The miasma weakens anyone who is exposed to it who doesn't have the ability to overcome it. The easiest method to overcome it is to receive an anointing, but particularly heroic individuals or those in possession of certain enchantments or magic items may also be able to counteract the effect. In particular, those of the changeling lineage are able to fight the effects of the miasma, but at the expense of becoming extremely angry, which eh, can cause problems all of its own. Ominous clouds. Siaka. The enmity against the eternal Siaka has been removed. Heralds of the Mother of Rex have been visiting the Empire. During the Spring Equinox, the Archmage of Spring raised a declaration of alignment to remove the enmity from the Mother of Rex, the dangerous and destructive Eternal of Spring, Siaka. This followed an agreement to send no more than half a dozen of her children into the Empire to see what they're about and to consider whether there might be hope for Imperial pirates after all. A parley is forthcoming. The Archmage is due to meet with her representatives during the coming summit. Over the last three months, however, it seems questionable whether Siaka has in fact restricted herself to half a dozen of her children in the Empire. At the very least, she's restricted herself to half a dozen at a time, because frighteningly wide-mouthed heralds have been spotted across the entire empire. Not all of them have shark-like aspects, but there is invariably something that suggests the water about them. For the most part, they just observe, watching sullenly from bodies of water, exploring the docks and quays at night, sometimes startling folk who come up on them unawares as they examine a boat or a pile of nets. They don't retreat, when challenged, and they never initiate combat. But if anyone is foolish enough to attack them, they immediately retaliate with killing force. For the most part, spring magicians and briars in particular are able to ensure there are no more than a minimum of violent engagements. Some of them do cause trouble, however, when the heralds encounter someone who strikes them as particularly bloodthirsty, or with a jealously guarded grudge, they waste no time encouraging that person to act and in some cases cheerfully provide that person with a minor boon. The most common are weapons that cleave through light armour and flesh, or unleash destructive energies or repel, hurl people around when they strike. Then they egg the people they've given these boons on until they do something foolish. There have been several incidents in Dawn, Varushka, the Marches and the League in which people have tried to settle old scores or take things that didn't belong to them under the approving gaze of these dreadful heralds. There's not a lot to be done about this, as long as Siaka is not under enmity, the heralds are free to visit the Empire as they wish. Fins in the water. A group of Siaka heralds is making the journey to Anvil on foot. Characters may have spotted them anywhere on the route from Samahome. One group of heralds might be more worrying. For the past couple of seasons, there have been whisperings of strange goings on in the waters of Axmuir, bodies found in rivers with large chunks gouged out of them. Stories of dire beasts lurking in the woods. Now a posse of misshapen creatures has emerged from the Semmer home on their way to Anvil by foot. The group is a surreal looking mix of heavily armoured shark creatures and what at first glance almost appears to be changelings with brightly coloured markings on their skin that glow softly in the night. Most of those encountering them on the roads have given them a wide berth, but a few who ventured closer report that the group have identified themselves as heralds of Siaka, following the trail of their prey. So far they've not attacked anyone, but they are likely to reach Anvil during the summer summit. It's not clear exactly when they'll arrive, or what their business is beyond seeking their prey. An empty road. Conjunction. A small group of Siaka heralds are challenging civilians to fight to the death. The Sentinel Gate will open at quarter past four on Saturday to the Long Road, Golden Downs in Mitwold. 
Sally, a prominent local thrasher, is responsible for dealing with the Heralds. There is a long, winding track in Mitwold that leads from Odd's End all the way to Hay. Not many people take it. It's much better to take the well-beaten path that goes straight or to go by ship along the coast to Mead and then travel along the river. The ones who do need to use it are those whose farms are not on any of the good paths, whose families have been working the same land for generations. And since the spring equinox, it seems they're the ones who've been encountering a problem with the heralds of the Mother of Rex. Steely Charlie, a beater on their bounds, brings news to the problem creatures. They're explicitly not initiating attacks on any Imperial citizens, but they are challenging anyone that passes them to fight to the death. If they continue, then eventually someone's going to step up and likely die. Being held in check by the leash of the Maelstrom herself, but what if that stopped? What if the heralds of destruction and savagery are unleashed upon Marcha Yeoman? There's also the question of why this is happening. The heralds of Siaka, and there's more than half a dozen of them here, incidentally, are mostly just poking around and talking to people, which perhaps explains what's happening here. Who have they been talking to? Who's persuaded them that they can serve their mistress by vandalising and destroying along this unbeaten path? Steely Charlie and their fellow beaters would very much like to know who's made this deal with the heralds of Siaka so that they, perhaps with some aid from some friendly threshers, can explain why they think it's a very bad idea. The group of Siaka heralds are clearly desperate for a fight but are held tight by the command of their mistress. Local marchers are clear this is exactly the sort of thing they'd expect the Threshers to sort out. So the civil service have asked Sally Thresher of House Talbot, a prominent Thresher, to take responsibility for solving the problem. If they're not available, then John Grancob of House Balston or Sebastian Shaw of House Talbot, both well-respected Threshers, will hopefully step in. Whatever happens, someone's going to have to deal with the Heralds by providing them with the fight that they're clearly desperate for. If they can find out in the process why they're doing this, so much the better. But either way, they can't be left to harass the people of Mitwold. And it's not as if their mistress has amity. The Winter's Grasping Chains. Tharim. The ban against heralds on the Hall of World continues to operate. Tharim has expressed an interest in certain cursed curios sold on behalf of the Alders Bart family of Sarkophan. A counterproposal has been presented that would help the Sarkophan escape their curse. Tharim of the thrice-cursed court continues to ward the Hall of Worlds from intrusion by heralds. As long as the bound king continues to be a friend of the Empire and an image of the Eternal is displayed during conclave sessions that is visible throughout the Hall of Worlds, the ward will persist. Unless they are responding to a parley, heralds will be unable to enter the hall if their master is under enmity, and those whose matter is neutral will not be able to cross the hall without an invitation from an imperial magician. Shortly before the solstice, a grim-faced emissary in black and gold robes appears in the Hall of Worlds, one arm bound tightly to their body by bloody ropes. They bring a message from the Bound King's court. Apparently... Over the last several seasons, representatives of a Sarkophan Delves family called Alders Bart have been visiting Anvil to sell accursed relics to Imperial collectors. This is not a secret. They attended during autumn and winter last year and again during the spring equinox. Innkeepers and hostlers all along the route between Crown's Quay and Anvil still mutter their name darkly. Given the vague awe of misfortune that followed in their wake, and the Sarkophan merchants often now encounter a cold welcome as a consequence. Tharim views this trade as a craven attempt by the Alders Bart to avoid the consequences of their actions and slip the bonds they wound around themselves. The emissary won't go into detail. The Sarkophan family knows what they did. Obviously, the ritual tribute to the thrice cursed court is currently illegal to perform in the Empire, thanks to the Conclave's entirely understandable anger at the regrettable actions of the Hag Queen. However, were any of the accursed curios to find their way to Tharim via this ritual, he would be able to untangle the magic of the curse the object bore and ensure it is returned to where it belongs, in Sarkophan, at the estates of the Alders Bart. Some of the objects are not actually magical items. 
or the Dwemer may have faded, but no matter. Tharim wants the items anyway, and the ritual will work on them. He's sure. Again, not that any Imperial citizen would want to cast it, but if the bulk of the curios slipped to Imperial collectors are found and dealt with in this fashion, Tharim would be grateful. There has been no word of the Alders Bart family themselves since their visit to Anvil in the spring. However, the Winter Coven Irime Frost, believed to be on good terms with the Bedela Huispas, have let it be known that there may be a counter-opportunity here. They believe the ritual words of ending could be used on the cursed curio, shattering the curse in its entirety, denying the power to the thrice-cursed court and potentially liberating the Sarkophon merchant family from their misfortunes. As long as the ritual were performed far from the Delves, or from any citizen of the Delves, the maledictions would simply dissipate. The Alders Bart would no doubt be at least as grateful as Tharim if they were freed of their curse. One ritual alone is unlikely to swing the pendulum in either direction, but if a sufficient number of items are either destroyed or offered as tribute, either the court or the Alders Bart are sure to show their gratitude to those involved. A Star at Twilight Lemwe After meeting with the Archmage of Day, the Eternal Yenwe, once known as Yenrith, has made offers of restitution for past poor behaviour. Lemwe has been considered an enemy of the Empire by the Imperial Conclave for some time now. During the Spring Equinox, the Archmage of Day, Skywise Gralka, met with the Eternal to discuss the situation. Shortly after the Spring Equinox, a sarcophan magician named Pia Jixma, who works at the Aravetti Estates Enclave in Karakamari, delivers a message on behalf of the Dove which lays out several proposals to end the breach between the Empire and the Perfect Morning. One of the four ways that the Archmage suggested the situation might be resolved, Lenwe believes Z can do something concrete with half of them. The Swan's Chalice still exists, and Lenwe would dearly like it to be back in the hands of an Imperial magician. Unfortunately, it's currently in the possession of a Druj Gulai of the Sarangrave, who takes great pleasure in befouling it. Yet the Eternal is bound by covenant to renew its power each year. The chalice is due to be renewed during the autumn equinox, but there may be a way for the Empire to recapture the item at that time. If the Imperial Conclave uses a Declaration of Concord to assign one of the Conclave orders to serve as an escort for the Herald Z Sends, then once the item is renewed, they could take it from the disgusting Gulai. Z cannot assure an opening of the Sentinel Gate, but believes that the connection was made Fate would do the rest. It would, however, be necessary to remove the enmity before the chalice was returned to Anvil, lest the magistrates rightly immediately seize and destroy it. What happened to the chalice after that would be a matter for the conclave to discuss. The Archmage mentioned the grand project to build a beacon of the way in the White City. Z is interested, especially in the possibility of including beautiful bell towers that would celebrate the faith of the people visiting the city. Lemwe is cautious, however. Would the aid Z offers even be acceptable to priests of the Empire? If the Conclave removes the enmity, and the General Assembly or the Highborn National Assembly uses a statement of principle to invite Lemwe to offer support to the project, Z will gladly take part. The shield, Ajax, born by the Champion of Pride, is cursed by the Druge. There are two obvious ways to remove the curse. One could ask the Eternal responsible for the curse directly, which Z believes is most likely our Halligan. Alternatively, as analysis of the shield reveals, the waters of a certain spring, precious to an Eternal of the Empire placed under enmity many years ago, will wash it away. Z warns, however, that in the process of cleansing the shield, the waters will become fouled by the curse, potentially permanently. Whoever undertakes this task must consider carefully how to avoid destroying the precious spring, unless their goal is to infuriate the Eternal who oversees it. Yemwe cannot, in good conscience, help the Empire trespass on the spring in question, and urges the appropriate Archmage to request access directly from the one who owns it. On the matter of the shards of music being sought by Imperial citizens, Yemwe is unable to offer much concrete support. Z knows that each fragment was somewhere in Anvil during the Spring Equinox and believes the same will be true at the Summer Solstice. Z also knows that someone has the capacity to make contact with the unpredictable mage of Forgotten Days who took the power of the stars and wove a prison from it, who can almost certainly provide any missing pieces, but unfortunately not who they are or how they might be contacted. 
is he does know one thing, though, which he hopes might be of use to Imperial magicians. While the music might be found and reassembled, as resonances of the constellations themselves, the lock and key must be in agreement to their power being drawn through the playing of that music. Such agreement is likely to coincide to when events or actions in the world below resonate with their nature. All statements, which may mean more to astronomancers or those involved in pursuing the musical shards. Pia can't elaborate on any of these matters herself. While she's on reasonable terms with de Duif, she's merely a messenger. She hints obliquely that it's good for her if the Empire doesn't rebuild their bridges with the Amway, because then she will continue to be paid to serve as a go-between. A steady burning light. Zakalwi. Zakalwi will be sending his heralds, Aegon and the opening gambit, to Dawn at 7.30 on Friday to reward the members of the Dornish team that participated in the great game. Aegon and the opening gambit will then travel to Wintermark to offer up the next stage in the challenge of the great game to the strategists of Wintermark. A second herald named Asp is planning to visit the Imperial Orcs at 1pm on Saturday as a result of a request from the Archmage of Day. During the spring equinox, a team of carefully selected strategists from Dawn took part in a complex simulation crafted by Zakalwe, testing their acumen and resolve as they refought one of the campaigns from the reign of Empress Brannan. The weapon-wise is apparently pleased with how well they acquitted themselves and instructed his Lieutenant Aegon to show his appreciation. He's also charged with finding a team of Wintermark tacticians to take part in the next stage of the Great Game to take place at the Autumn Equinox. Aegon and the opening gambit will be visiting Anvil at half seven on Friday to speak to the Dornish, then proceeding on to Wintermark, and anyone who wishes to speak with them should be able to find them in one camp or the other. While Aegon is busy with one matter of games, a second herald named Asp is expected to visit the Imperial Orcs to talk on a slightly different matter. During the Spring Equinox, the Archmage of Day asked that Sakalwi help the Imperial Orcs to devise a new strategy game for the nation to play. Asp, another lieutenant of the General of the Day, has expressed an interest in the request, and Zakalwe has given them leave to visit the Imperial Orcs to discuss the matter. They expect to arrive at around 1pm on Saturday. <laughs>